Hello and welcome to Digital Photography's i3 lecture series. We are thrilled to have Susan Bright as tonight's guest lecturer. Susan's curatorial practice operates across exhibitions, writing, public speaking, and teaching. In past years, she has worked as assistant curator at the National Portrait Gallery and acting director for the MA Photography Program at Sotheby's Institute of Art, London. She was visiting artist in MFA Photography Program at the Arts Institute Boston in the spring of 2014. Recent exhibitions include Home Truths, Photography and Motherhood at the Photographer's Gallery and the Foundling Museum in London, Something Out of Nothing at Photogallery at Oslo, How We Are, Photographing Britain at Tate Britain, and Face of Fashion at the National Portrait Gallery in London. Susan is the author of Art Photography Now, 2005 and 2011, and Autofocus, the Self-Portrait in Contemporary Photography, 2010. Both of them published by Thompson Hudson. Her most recent book, Home Truths, Photography and Motherhood, is published by Art Books. So please help me welcome Susan Bright to our lecture series. <laughs> Let's just get this out. Um, thank you again for coming in the rain, really. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here, because I really didn't think anyone was going to be. Um, and also, I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to read, and I know usually people just go, oh, God, she's going to read. Um, but I'm going to tell you why I'm going to read. And, um, and I want you to try and kind of go with it. Um, firstly, I've been more and more intrigued by audiobooks and the fact that we don't passively listen to much anymore. Um, also, I'm a huge lover of radio, public radio, and uh, I find myself often cooking, because this is where I listen to the radio, and I'll stop and I'll just listen. And it's lovely. It's really wonderful. So um, I just think it's something that we should kind of bring back, the storytelling and the reading. I also read large amounts of very huge books to my daughter. And she loves it. We spend hours reading so and listening. So I, I'm not, I can't promise that I'm a great reader. This is the first time I've done it. Um, and I might abandon it after a paragraph or two. <laughs> but my, my intention is to kind of lull you into a public radio kind of atmosphere. So <coughs> come with me, OK? <laughs> we'll take the donations at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the project that uh, has been mentioned. I'm not actually going to talk about the curatorial process or putting the book together, because I've talked about it a lot, and I'm a bit bored of it. Um, and also, there's lots of lectures online that you can, if you're really interested in how I put it together, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of information out there in the world for it. So what I'm going to do today is instead just pick out some of the images and think about how they operate in this world that we live in of autobiographical uh, photography. So my selection stemmed from a very ambiguous piece by Janine Antoni. In habit shows the artist suspended above the ground, held in place in her daughter's bedroom by ropes, as a spider spins a web against her leg, which is caged by a doll's house that Antoni is wearing as a skirt. It's unclear, with, unclear whether she's suspended or ascending, entrapped or part of the structure. Multi-layered, she is both blessed and bound, showing a simultaneous desire to escape and connect. She's left swinging. She's in limbo. She is fluid. Her mother, her role as a mother, has become a relationship with the objects around her. She floats. One cut of the ropes and everything would fall. Her vulnerability simultaneously contrasts the way that motherhood catches somebody in a web as well as being the person that creates it. She is both powerless and powerful. Antoni has claimed Louise Bourgeois as an art mother, and her influence <coughs> can be seen repeatedly throughout this photograph, 
most obviously with the spider references and the rope. But also to Bourgeois' version of the Femme Maison drawings. These were done in 1945 to 1947. These drawings reflect a woman whose upper torso has become a house, reflecting the idea of the home as essentially a female place where notions of family, identity and self can be explored and place a place where gender ideologies are most firmly rooted. Inhabit works in a similar way, although Antoni, on first appearances, seems to have been giving herself more freedom. She chooses to wear the skirt, whereas this woman, who we assume is bourgeois, is melded to the house, as if her fate is literally sealed. But on closer inspections, Antoni's choices are equally limited, if not hopeless to recognize. A step in either direction has no solution. One cut and she would be crumpled and the house destroyed. Left hanging, she is immobile. There's really no choice at all for her. Her fate as the mother spider is as sealed as bourgeoise's is. If we see this through the, to the end, she will be forever giving and giving so the spider can survive, just like a real mother spider who dies after weaving her egg sac for her young. Other references to bourgeois start to come through on closer inspection of the photograph. Bourgeois started to make her cells in the 1980s when she was in her 70s. These spaces, in these spaces, she returns to her childhood and autobiographical references litter. But what kind of spaces these cells are are very unclear. They prison cells, metaphorical manifestations of psychic space, or are they bedrooms? or another kind of domestic space, a room of one's own, where the artist is free to remember. The return to themes around early family memories show a defiance of old age. And these works led to later works, which she did in her 90s, which all right, went back straight back to maternal concerns. Then she subjectively moves between past and present and between her roles as mother and daughter. In old age, she refused to be compromised by the chronological narrative of life. Cell 26, which we have here, does not deal with maternal concerns directly as other cells do, but I believe that the elements of this echo through inhabit. In cell 26, Bourgeois has created a prosthetic body that twists and turns as it hangs. I see it as a surrogate self-portrait causing contrast contrary effect. And like the Femme Maisons, the, the bottom half is clearly female, but the top half is other. Perhaps it's inside out and it represents guts. Or perhaps it is a figure that has entrapped and embodied itself as it struggles to get free. Like Antoni, it is in limbo in a room that has domestic registers. The skirts that hang, you can't really see them, but you, the, the white triangles kind of towards the back and an enlarged mirror that distorts rather than reflects. In contrast the room in which Antoni hangs is garish as only rooms of young children are. It is also not hers. There is no intimacy in her space as there is in this cell but there's also no anxiety. A child's room is a safe room whereas this cell is not somewhere I would ever want to go in. It is, however, resolutely bourgeoise's private space, whereas the idea of personal space is challenged in inhabit. And Tony is the owner, the keeper, the maker of the home, but it's a home made for sharing. So these references and similarities to bourgeois work add layers of complexity to an already very ambiguous piece. The push and pull between the vulnerability and delicacy of her maternal identity and her immense physical strength is echoed by the tiny spider that has managed to weave a web against her leg in a meta version of the composition. This echoing of roles acts like a Russian doll, highlighting repetitions of domestic and maternal duties passing through generations. Repetitions, echoes, generations, 
can all be seen of notions of maternal entrapment or constraint, suffocating in their limit, claustrophobic in their inevitability, but they can also be seen of acts of love. The cooking of dinner, the folding of laundry, the washing of hair, the singing of lullabies, the rocking of a baby, are associated with more traditional maternal qualities, such as nurture, protection and care. And Inhabit also engages with these registers through a Madonna motif, which reverberated through many of the works in Home Truths, a motif where the active role of the mother is central. So one of the sources for Inhabit was uh, the Virgin of Mercy. In painting, she is depicting enveloping her followers in her mantle that resembles the apse of a church. There is nothing submissive or weak about her nurturing gesture. The act of caring is not one that demands a typically limiting reading. The Madonna is self-embodied and self-confident. But, but it's still hard for me to escape that idea of entrapment. The mantle could so easily suffocate or smother. And I'm reminded of another surrogate mother who used her mantle to nurture a young child. My poor child, she said, in quite a different voice. How cold you look. Come and sit with me here on the sledge, and I will put my mantle round you and we will talk. This mantle belongs to the white witch in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and she may protect, but to what end? It shows that little can be taken on face value. In the same way that suspen the suspending figure in cell 26 twists and turns at whatever angle you are viewed from, it's viewed from, inhabit operates similarly. It can be read in multiple ways, never giving any clear-cut answers, but instead a series of contradictions. Motherhood, as Antoni has represented it, is one full of ambivalence, fluidity, fluctuation, in a constant process of change and becoming. So it was through these in series of encounters, of which there were many more, that's just two of them, uh, that I had within the habit, together with its sheer objectness, you can see here its vast size, uh, that ensured that it became the centerpiece for Home Truths, in the same way that that Madonna of Mercy was the centerpiece of that altarpiece. It was my guide, both conceptually and aesthetically, through which the other works in Home Truths were selected. And Tony became the mother spider from which the other works spun, often colliding in a constellation of experiences. So this allowed the exhibition to have a very particular feel to it, one of seriousness and one of intense reflection, one that showed a real uncertainty and doubt about motherhood, which was haunting and unjudgmental. The artists that ricocheted off this initial selection of Inhabit articulated different viewpoints on the subjects, views that complemented and complemented each other in order to avoid a didactic or monolithic or even an illustrative view of mothering. They were still, however, bound by an articulation of changing and shifting identities in the mother figure and a desire to tell their experience. Are you still with me? Great. <laughs> but what's the, all this got to do with selfies, which um, I think probably people are more interested in, and uh, what it said on my blurb that I was going to talk about. And I would argue quite a lot. Um, but first we have to consider two things. So the first thing to consider is that Home Truths, <coughs> which uh, opened uh, at the end of last year and then traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Photography and is now at Belfast Exposed, uh, it occurred or coincided when autobiographical approaches in visual, literary, and popular culture are dominant, from reality TV through to GoPro and the ubiquitous selfie phenomenon how can we now look at autobiographical fine art photography with these approaches operating so forcibly in global visual culture? 
But rather than viewing these different iterations of maternal photography in opposition to one another, I would argue for a more constructive way of exploring these approaches, one that permits them to be seen as productive expressions of colliding photographic voices whose invocation of the maternal is reinforced and sustained by each other. They are part of a very rich script of photographic representations of maternal subjectivities in the early 21st century, whether they critique or celebrate modern motherhood. My practice also coincided with an increased um, interest in mothering and the subject of the mother figure. You don't have to read all that quote because you get, you get the idea. So the show and the book is set against the celebrity mom. And this is all about teenage pregnancy, which um, is a hugely difficult, ambiguous, can be dreadful experience, which has huge kind of social ramifications, but you wouldn't get any of that from looking at these covers. They're completely glamorized and ideal, idealized. Celebrity motherhood erases powerful feelings of ambivalence that characterize experienced motherhood and is central to many feminists' analysis of maternal representation and experience. So the celebrity mum phenomenon um, fascinates me because what you see over and over again are repeated tropes and visual um, <coughs> posing, I guess is the, is the just simplest way to put it. And uh, this is just a quick list of um, some that I kept experiencing and keep experiencing. The first one being the iconography of the sexy nude portrait, which obviously takes its cue from the 1991 Demi Moore portrait by um, Annie Leibovitz. Um, don't Google this. You never need to Google this because you get all kinds of weird stuff come up. Um, <laughs> I'm still kind of slightly traumatized by that. Um, but you can see again how it's both kind of modest in a way, but less so than the um, Leibovitz, but sexy. So it kind of appeals to both sides. You can also get the, the post-birth snap back into shape. These I just found in like two seconds. You know, if I'd actually spent a long time researching these, maybe I would have got better pictures, but you know, this is what, you know, this is what you get. And also cute outings with children. Um, I very, very rarely, if ever, have seen pictures of nannies only loving husbands. And in all the mix of this, of which this is just three, again, you can probably all think of other tropes. The, the Madonna holding the baby like this is a, obviously one where the couples are usually heterosexual, white or pastel colors being used. Um, what I found a really interesting kind of colliery with uh, stepmoms or, st or, or gay families that have surrogates is they don't tend to cradle their baby like a Madonna. They will hold it up as it's kind of fun. Um, and I, I don't really understand why they can't, you know, why the two are so distinctly different. So in the mix of all these celebrity uh, pictures, you get the selfie. So what do we know about selfies? You probably know as much as I do. Um, here are just some things that I've thought about. They're new. Uh, they're, they entered the English Oxford Dictionary, which is you know, my blueprint, uh, in 2013. So only last year. They occur online. They are pictures taken of yourself. But the term has kind of been um, bastardized and used for all self-portraits now. I keep seeing it used all over the place. And that really makes me angry. Um, and it's used incorrectly. There are an awful lot of them. A recent New York Times article says that Snapchat are producing, well, guess, guess how many they're producing a day. So this is Snapchat. This is not even Instagram, which is the most common for selfies. Okay, up, uh, more, more, we've got a million, uh, more. <laughs> Less. <laughs> okay, we're on 35 million each day. So we all know that also that 
people react better to selfies if they, we put them in our feed. We will always get more selfies, as long as we don't put too many in. They also show what we're doing, where we are, what we feel like, and we're sharing experience. They can nudge friends to get in touch with you, because if they see my selfie today that I'm down here, they go, oh, I'm just around the corner working, let's meet for coffee. Uh, we also know that words are important. Uh, hashtags are used for a way of understanding them. And word, this I find really fascinating because I can't think of any other photography apart from photojournalism where words and text and image are of equal importance. Of course, text is very different in photojournalism, but you need both, and you <coughs> need both with the selfie as well. Uh, also, the tagging, as we know, and the hashtagging allows them to be classified and grouped together. All new things um, uh, with family, family photography or um, vernacular photography. We also know that photographically they're not very interesting. They're very formulaic, they're conventional. People who take selfies are not photographers, although of course photographers can take them too. They're people like, like you and I who look at a huge amount of celebrity images, whether we like it or not, or vernacular images, and we try to copy them. They find a formula and we stick with it. Norms and standards have developed very, very quickly. So they're not really a desire to capture the self or an individual or yourselves, but it's more to belong. And they're communicative. This is key. Um, they're there so that you can, other people can respond to you. They're a very quick start way of arranging your body. And we can all think of uh, poses like duck face um, mm -hmm. or, you know, when you muscle pop or um, when you get your head just in a corner or you take your feet. I mean, we could probably think of 10, I think, if we really thought hard. Um, of those poses and I kind of think of those poses a bit like the filters on Instagram that these are your choices this is what you've got these are the options you can't go any other way and actually we don't really want anymore we don't really want people to be raw and authentic in a in a in a selfie we do we just we know what they are they're fun um, and we know and this this idea of being limited I think it, it, could, it gets even narrower because if I take a selfie and I get loads of likes, the next selfie that I take is going to be the same because I want to get lots of likes. Um, so the standards become narrow and narrow and more and more normative um, and less and less ambiguous. So the selfie is a cultural signifier whose production, consumption and circulation demands new kind of social dynamics that shifts the way that we understand family photography and, I would argue, the self-portrait. So the selfie is commonly understood as a truth-telling function. It stands as testimonial. It is the event and the photographic record fusing. The selfie proves you are you, where you are, and it relies on the community to make it work. This means selfies exist within a formulaic and limited aesthetic repertoire rather than being an extension of art historical self-portraiture. This separation from the canyon of genres and understanding it as separate from this tradition crystallizes it in a moment of contemporary culture. The selfie has become a photographic genre reliant on community in a way that traditional self photographic self-portraiture has never been. The use of text, hashtags, and often emoticons is unlike any other type of self-portrait, as the sitter's role is that of subject, photographer, and audience. It requires communal understanding of peer group norms and conventions. There's no literally literary equivalent as there is in self-portraiture, where you have the memoir or the autobiography. It is completely kind of on its own. So there are kind of my thoughts on the selfie. And here are some stylized facts that we have about selfies based on asking my friends 
and my family to get the most reactionary um, opinion about them. That they're taken by young people on the whole, that it's about self-esteem. So if you're feeling bad and you do a selfie and then post it and you get lots of likes, you're gonna feel great. Conversely, if you take one and you don't get loads of likes, then you feel bad, so that's, that's not great. Uh, they also raise questions about vanity, narcissism, obsession, and obsession with body type and beauty. I think they can be all of these things. And I guess if the person is taking them as a narcissistic, self-obsessed teenager with body problems, then all those things are going to come up. But I think it's, as I've said, they're very narrow, but they're also a voice. And I don't think we can blame the selfie. I think we can change the script. We can sing a different song. So it's kind of up to everyone who takes them to make them different, if people really want them to be different, which I don't really think that they are. So are they diaries? Are they kind of a new form of live autobiography? And now I'm not sure I totally agree with how encompassing um, this uh, theorist believes that they are. I don't think they really are about being oneself. I think they're much more about being the same as others. But they are a way of saying, look at me. Look at this expensive food I can afford. Look at this fancy restaurant I'm in. Look at all the cool people I'm hanging out with. So they can be really aspirational. And again, that doesn't need necessarily need to be a bad thing. It does fix the self in the same way that those, the Janine Antoni was completely fluid, a selfie does the opposite, right down to the minutiae of coffee, hair, lips, nails. But as I have suggested, nobody really wants to see the real you. We all get that it's a convention. Why would we want to see something raw and authentic? What, you know, when we're strolling through our phones, this is not the apparatus for it. I kind of think selfies are the norm core of photography. I don't think photographies have, uh, selfies have an opinion. I don't think selfies like to rock the boat. And I don't think selfies are ambiguous which brings me back to mothers. And I'm slightly obsessed with Snooky, as you may have guessed. Um, and as you already may already know, Snooky is Nicole Elizabeth Snooky Polzini, born in 1987. And she's an American reality TV personality, best known for being a cast member of uh, the MTV reality show Jersey Shore, and currently stars in Snoo I don't know how you pronounce this, Snooky and Jay Wow, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, which I, I have to confess, I, of which I've seen neither. I'm really obsessed with her um, online presence, um, which I follow compulsively. <laughs> and uh, I was distraught today to say, to, she did this great post of like, no, I'm not pregnant. I was like, oh, thank God, because she posts about five selfies a day and, and the whole pregnancy seemed to, la her last pregnancy seemed to last about five years. And I was so glad that she's not pregnant again after her wedding. Um, but this is the image that really I keep coming back to over and over again. Um, and it's for me, it's a perfect example of what has been kind of coined in popular culture as the new momism, um, where everything is, uh, you're obsessed with, um, Everything is in relation to your role as a mother. So if you have a short haircut, you've got a mum haircut. If you uh, go and watch your kid play soccer, you're a soccer mum. You know, this, if you go out with your girlfriends, you're having a mum's night out. Everything seems to be kind of codified around this. And it's like, you know, what, what, where are we at? Are we really back to being a woman being um, understood by her relationship to her children or her husband. What about all those women that, you know, this divides women as to, to that, what they have and they have not. Um, but here we've, got, here we've got going on is all those things that I showed you in those photographs. So we've got the snap back to figure. This is, I'm gonna read the caption. I think it's not a caption, I don't know what you call them. Uh, Beast mode shirt wearing it in honor of getting the okay to start working out again. Cannot wait to kill it in the gym again. 
get ready, motivated, determined. So uh, what she hasn't done here is a hashtag, which I've started following again, of um, one month postpartum, two month postpartum, so that you can pull up you know, all these gorgeous women doing yoga after six weeks of having their baby. <laughs> so we've got the snap back to figure, you know, and she looks amazing, let's face it. Uh, so I think this was about six weeks after she, her second baby. We've got the back to work, because actually her work is social media. Uh, her work is her new line of clothing, which is Beast Mode, a t-shirt you can see here. It's part of her new line, it's Nuki Love. <laughs> really shouldn't have this in my head. Um, so she's designed it. So we have, again, that, that commercial element bringing in what, again, what, what motherhood can do to celebrities is give them another kind of huge push. Jessica Simpson's a great example. She hadn't had a hit for 10 years, suddenly got pregnant, and she's got new lines of clothes. She's in, you know, on all the chat shows. So it can reignite a very kind of flagging um, career. It's very motivational as well. Um, this with the, with the hashtags of motivated and determined. But it's weird, yeah? It's like, um, what's she doing? She's obviously in the bathroom. I can't quite figure it out. Maybe you can. I think she's taking that in the mirror, yes? But then why is she looking at the camera and doing a duck face? It's kind of like a meta selfie within a selfie. It's like she's, she's cre you know, creating for the phone. She understands, you know, what I'm trying to say, I think, is she understands so well, because she done, does so many, all those, the way that you throw your, po your body in your poses. Even though she knows that the full selfie is not going to be that close up of what she's seeing herself in the, um, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, it's weird, and I kind of can't, I kind of can't get enough of it. Um, and it makes me think, what's the significance of viewing all these idealized images of motherhood? Is it simply another step towards the specularization of women's lives? Is it glossing over lived experience? And how might we be counter that as artists or historians or curators? And I think it kind of goes back to my call for you know, arms, is that we all have a voice. And um, we can all counter that. And I want to show an example of a Katie, uh, Katie Murray, who I think countered this rather brilliantly. This is not the actual piece, but you will see bits of her video in it. It's an interview with her. I consider myself a still photographer. And so it's always important for me when I make the decision to um, go to video or go to moving image, that it's uh, weighted equally between what's happening visually, what's happening with movement, and what's happening with sound. I found the gazelle on a rather boring, mundane Saturday afternoon. There was a garage sale, and there it was on the street, and I thought, this is it, this is the answer. If I buy this thing, I will be healthy and happy and feel better about myself. Be happy, be healthy, live longer, have higher energy, Tony Little is sort of a staple of late night infomercial American television. Purchasing the video, riding on the gazelle as I'm purchasing the video started to, uh, that was the seed of, of an idea. And then uh, my youngest son started walking around and crawling and I thought that I would potentially kill him if I had hit him with this gazelle machine as it's swaying back and forth. And so I started to put him on me to exercise. And so because the machine is called the gazelle, that's the name of the machine, I started to look for gazelle footage and I knew that I needed to have this moment, which was taking place in, in my domestic space, relate to something larger and more primal. It's exciting as, it, as the show sort of presses and asks the question, what is photography now? And how has photography uh, shifted in this contemporary culture? And I think video is a, an important element in that conversation. But it's also exciting and um, 
satisfying to be included in a larger dialogue about motherhood and um, and, and not only motherhood, but you know, the making of work as it re revolves around motherhood. So Katie teaches at SVA, um, and uh, I, I put her in the show. It was um, a thing that curators do, which is really annoying, is they kind of have the, the show sewn up, and then they see another bit of work, and they go, "Oh, I've got to have it in." And you know, the, the gallery is like, "No, we've you know we've got reached our budget." That's usually the thing. I was like, no, we've got to have it. I've got to have Katie in. Because I think that if you think she's trying to lose weight, she's motivational. If we could hashtag that as determined, you know, it's absolutely the kind of flip side of this, this culture that we're living in, which is kind of exemplified by Snooky. Um, at the very end of that video, the gazelle, which is being attacked, so it's, it, this gazelle mother is trying to feed her young, and he's being attacked by these cheetah cubs. And eventually, it manages to flee. And you can quite imagine Katie doing the same thing, you know, <laughs> just putting her babies down and walking out the door, um, which you would never, ever get that feeling with um, Snooky. You know, the, it, the, the, these right, uh, realistic ideas of frustration and anger and uh, all those things that come with motherhood are just, are just erased from celebrity culture. So what Murray does is, is agitate the representations of celebrity and the vernacular mother. It's both autobiographical and also a self-portrait, a combination which lots of works in Home Truths had. And it operated on lots of different registers. It's, it was emotional, it was embarrassing, uh, it was you know, a little bit shocking, but also really funny, um, <coughs> which is much needed in um, especially a show around this topic, which can be kind of heavy. Uh, the work was very raw and authentic, and it shone a torch onto the subjects that has been boxed and continue to be boxed into ideals and um, fantasies. Self-portraits have always played a testimonial role, but what differs here is the approach is not one that was relying on the notion of photography, or video in this case, as intrinsically indexical. The selfie, is a photographic I am here marker, similar to those old, you're probably all too young to remember these, those doodles that you used to get with I was here, those Kilroy doodles, you know, the big someone peering over a wall. It's kind of the photographic equivalent to that. With Snooky, the viewer presumes that the whole image has not been doctored or photoshopped in any way. So if it, if it was, then that would fictionalize the I was here aspect. Mothers photographing themselves through the app apparatus of photo sharing may occupy a range of positions, but all of them all seem to use that testimonial capacity. Murray may utilize the mechanics of, the, of vernacular culture. This video has a kind of DIY YouTube aesthetic, but it's a performance piece. It's clearly framed to fit under the awnings of art. There is nothing I was here about this work. It's conscious and it's made to think through an idea, to embody and to inform something. So this is another installation shot uh, from Home Truth, which was set over two venues, the Photographer's Gallery, which I've shown you already, and a smaller part of the show, uh, which was at the Foundling Museum, also in London. Um, and this part of the show mainly dealt with issues of loss, whereas the work at the Photographer's Gallery dealt with ideas of abundance, which was ch again chiming into photographic culture, where the abundance of the, you know, the selfie and the uh, celebrity culture and Instagram going on at the photographer's gallery and the loss of the photographic album and the photographic object taking place at the foundling. So I hope that Home Truths asks what happens when an audience is allowed into intimate and conflicted situations through photography. The, co the, co sorry, the coexistence of different photographs, the celebrity, the vernacular, the documentary and art, all around motherhood, demands more of an audience when walking into home truths and also demands more of the artists. It asks questions like, who is it for? This question was very pertinent because the level of intimacy, which was unusual for an exhibition. Questions like, where was she? Where am I? 
Am I complicit? Where does she want me to be? Is there an implied self-judgment from the curator for the audience? In addition, it also raised questions about distribu distribution and privacy. From who, for whom was this made and where was it shown? Time. Work in a gallery is slow. Mass consumption is fast. Permission to view or reproduce. And ethics. Are there in ethical implications for the viewer, and should there be? So Home Truths occurred at a time when demands on, are high on curators to engage with dynamic and photographic culture. Every time I walk into a gallery or I talk to a curator, everyone's kind of slightly panicked about, but what are we going to do about Instagram? And I'm like, well, you know what? <laughs> Museums and galleries have ignored vernacular photography for, you know, most of its existence. So why now, why now this panic to, to engage with it? Um, but it's absolutely there. And I think um, curators need to engage with it, but not by putting selfies on walls, because nobody wants to see that. So we're experiencing photography at a time that is perhaps its most vibrant in its very short hit history when the ubiquity of one certain type of photographic practice influences the nature of art exhibitions that has never occurred before. So Home Truths attempted to rise to this challenge by acknowledging those changes in terms of autobiographical approaches to phot photography and the increase of the mother as a commodity. It wasn't directly dealing with that, but it did it obliquely. And there was a mutual exchange between the artwork and the larger cultural relations to that I had to deal with. I aim to challenge those aesthetics, those prevailing aesthetic experiences, and hope to show that the figure of the mother could produce new ways of thinking and looking at art, which were very high expectations. Um, just to finish, I'm gonna lower my uh, standards because it's the last lecture of the year and it's nearly the holidays. So I want to show you this. Uh, which made me laugh <laughs> and was just a great example of, you know, as I was saying that we need, you know, if, if, if the demand is on curators to respond to this culture, then this was just a really fantastic way of doing that. And it's done by a Dutch designer. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Um, I noticed something really interesting with the uh, the beast mode picture by Snooky. What she looked like was a Latino Barbie that you will see in the flea markets anywhere in Latin America where they've taken the, the Barbie hair out and put in this big colored fluff. And she looks like she just was picked up off the rack uh, or off a table in a flea market in Oaxaca. I just find that really fascinating, the whole foofy plastic hair thing. Yeah, the hair is amazing. And it's always um, the same in every single selfie that she does. And uh, it, it always is beautifully done. I mean, it, it's, it, she must spend a lot of time. So I'm saying, I may be exaggerating, she, she probably posts around two or three a day. But each, each selfie has a change of clothes mm -hmm. and often different makeup and the hair has been done. So as I said, her career really is, you know, is social media. There's a lot of time dedicated to, to getting that out there. Any other thoughts? But to, to Richard's point, uh, do you think there's an implication that she is presenting herself as a plaything, like a Barbie doll would be? No. With the snooky shop and all of that stuff? No, I think she's very serious about herself. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. <laughs> and she's a good businesswoman. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like I said, it's part of this, this um, attention economy. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's what the reality TV, one of the kind of sprawling parts of, of that. 
doesn't have to be a question. It can just be a thought. Um, I, you know, talking to you before the lecture, um, you explained to me the as connotations of home truth for a British speaker. Could you talk about that for our audience as well? Yeah, we're, we're talking about the title, and I'm really bad at titles. Titles plague me. Um, and actually, this came from an essay um, called Home Truths, which um, takes two artists and, and takes that Foucauldian idea of a truth teller and the artists can be the ones that can kind of have that voice to tell the truth. Um, so that was definitely an influence in the title. But as a, as a saying, if someone's, um, and I don't know if you use this in the States, um, that a home truth is a truth, if someone tells you something that you don't necessarily want to hear. So it will be, a home truth would be if someone told you you have bad breath. Um, so that and that idea that actually when you walk into the exhibition you're going to get things that you actually you might not want to see you may, if you didn't have kids it might put you off having kids this exhibition <laughs> um, but it's things that are hidden away things that are not talked about things like uh, there are things that I saw through this exhibition that I had never seen before about people who have IVF and they have to inject themselves. I didn't know that. I didn't know that their bodies were bruised. And, and I didn't know that, you know, that of cesarean scars look like they do. So it's also, it was, it's that actually this is, this is what mothering is about. It's not just about Madonnas and beautiful babies and bumps and Instagram. It's these, these kind of much more corporeal uh, elements that are in the expression that are not great and that you might get depressed and all these things as well. So that's, that's the way that we use a home truth. It's something that is maybe slightly embarrassing or uncomfortable um, to encounter. Oh look, that sparked off something. <laughs> Mother's first. <laughs> <laughs> <Come on. laughs> yeah, you can take it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's so great to hear you speak. Um, I'm a I recently became a mother and I'm a photographer and I've I've been struggling with you know making work and making work about myself and my family, which I was already doing before having kids. Um, and I'm also struggling with my with how I'm perceived in the world now um and I, I recently was showing my Instagram feed to which is mostly my daughter um shamelessly uh, showing it to a digital media strategist uh that, in, in quotes and um she said well this picture here of your uh, you know is pumping breast milk at a conference for photo educators and I posted that photo because I felt like it was important to to show people you can do both of these things and she said well this photo is going to have you you know you're going to be tagged as uh, mommy blogger so just be careful if you're putting that picture out there that's how you're going to be seen and I, I was very offended because I feel like she's just part of that problem I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, how you s you know how um, women photographers can strike this very delicate and challenging balance <laughs> I think it's very delicate and challenging um, and I think that's something which I hoped Home Truths didn't because you can walk into exhibitions about motherhood and you just go oh god here we go again, you know. And um, I really didn't want, I wanted this to kind of feel different because, you know, it, it, it's, it's a subject which has kind of been done to death, let's be honest about it. But it's a, it's a victim of its own success because people go, oh, I've done that. And so therefore the subject is closed is what actually w what I encountered here when I tried to place it in a gallery in New York is what I encountered here. Um, well, you know, Mary Kelly's done that. I was like, hang on, that was 1974. <laughs> and it's actually like saying, well, no, we've done race. Race is done. You know, it's like, no, actually, you know, we're living in a very different cultural environment and we need to respond to that constantly, whatever the subject. Um, I think you have to be very, very aware of um, and much more kind of calculated about it than anybody else does because people will, everyone's got an opinion on parenting, especially non-parents. Yeah, <laughs> that's my favorite advice is from them. Um, and, uh, and those those opinions and feelings are very subjective and very passionate on the whole. Um, and often people just let loose. So 
you've got to just kind of be really, really aware of all those things. And you either own it and claim it, or you do work about something else. You know, it's it's a, it's kind of like it's kind of like everything really, which just sounds kind of nebulous and useless. But um, it's it's how much of how much of it do you want to be to identify yourself as an artist? And I'm not saying that 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 it's bad to not do it. There are plenty of female artists who do nothing about their family. But if that was your practice then, you know, you've got to carry it on. I would, um, you know, people like Eleanor Carucci are really great to talk to, yeah. who has absolutely managed to, st to strike that balance. And also be, um, you know, you have to toughen up yeah. because um, people will say, oh, you're just this and just that and just this. So you have to be able to answer all those accusations without sounding defensive because it you know you kind of immediately makes you angry and you get defensive but you have to answer that by you know giving examples and placing yourself within a kind of historical and contemporary context of it and it's a perfectly legitimate subject that's the thing to really stress you know why why shouldn't you be doing this uh, thank you very much for such a great lecture um, I'm not too sure if you mentioned this um, but if you could sort of expand on this idea or comments on the idea of selfies as being a form of addiction as well. Um, this idea of self-validation is an addiction of... Yeah, this is part of the stylized fact, things I've asked my friends about, um, part of it. And it's actually, and it's, it's, it was an SVA class that I was teaching and I was like, why do you take, why do people take selfies? And that it was absolutely that self-esteem thing came up as a reason for taking it. Um, but also the quantity, a friend of mine was saying, here's a 15-year-old brother, which is not a kind of demographic that I encounter really. And he, they're all, Instagram is like for your mum, you know, it's um, Snapchat. And he was saying that they ha his brother has these long conversations <coughs> where they're just sending each other selfies. So it could be like 15, 16 selfies. And I was like, but OK, <laughs> here you go. This is your mum talking. If you were going to then turn those selfies into text equivalent, what would that conversation be? Oh, I'm happy, I'm sad, um, I'm over here, you make me laugh, look at this. You know, it's not a terribly interesting conversation, but somehow it manages to sustain a 15-year-old. Um, for, for a length of time. Um, I've forgotten your question now. <laughs> Sorry, selfies is an addiction. And also, have you taken a selfie yourself? No, I'm really bad at them, because I'm, I'm a really bad photographer. Um, so I don't really know how to do them. And I'm always really shocked at how old I look, because in my head, I'm 15, you know. And I'm like, oh, God, why? I don't want to look like that. Um, no, but I did go skating at the Rockefeller Center the other day and this this was just blew my head because I don't think people were actually going to skate I think they were going to take selfies of themselves skating yeah. because they spent ages queuing up <laughs> taking selfies posting them all I was looking at them all posting them waiting for skating they skated like twice around took their selfies and left and there were people with selfie sticks yep. skating <laughs> and I was just like wow this is at the heart what you know what I haven't thought this through this is just at the top of my head now so so, and it's being filmed, so. <laughs> um, the experience is changing. You know, it's experiencing, it's not there for the experience, it's experiencing there for photographic justification. And that's a huge shift in the way that we travel, in the way that we experience life, the way that we do everyday quotidian things. Would you in a way somewhat compare... Oh, 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 oh. microphone. <laughs> one last one, Right. Would you would you in a way somewhat compare selfies to perhaps a drug or um, to that taking a selfie and posting it and putting it online and put it, it's it's almost sort of simulates the feeling of um, drugs. Yeah, I th I think all social networking is like that. Uh, I know you know I I I'm not, I, I do a bit, but I know when I post something like I'm doing this talk tonight, I'm like checking 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 checking, and I actually came off Facebook because I would. Oh God, I'm really good. It's sort of letting out too much here. That I would think, oh, I'm going to this party tonight. What will be my self? What will be my status update? 
I'm like, what am I doing? I'm just, I should just be going to this party rather than thinking about how I'm going to report back about it. That's just nuts. So I was like, right, just get it out of my life. And it was, it was a kind of addiction, but I have a very compulsive personality. So I'm that kind of person that, you know, should never be given heroin because I'd be like, great. Right. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think if you do have that kind of inclination, then, then yeah, it is, it is, it, it is a kind of opiate. It is, it is, you know, in the same way that everyone's got their thing, you know. I feel just to continue on what you just said, it's about the um, happy hormones in our brain. Dopamine? Yeah. Dopamine? Yes. Yeah. So I think when people are posting and they're just waiting for those likes, it's just that tension. How many likes can I get? 50, 30, 2? And just that balance, the, the hormonal balance. Yeah, I, I had a... Uh, the great thing about teaching is that you teach a lot of people who are just kind of left home a lot of the time. And so their identity is really kind of insecure because they're not one thing and they're not quite the other. So social networking them, to them is hu really huge. And it's a bit like those pin boards <coughs> that a lot of kind of older adolescents used to make when you know, I used to stick out pictures. Um, again, I've lost the question. <laughs> no, th that was not dopamine. a question, just the dopamine. Right. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> like we all feel, you know, the excitement. But when I see photographs as of Snooki where she looks great, she just had her second child, right? Yeah. In this photograph. So where the regular women that do not have personal coach, you know, the, the private chef, it takes a longer time to get back to your regular body. And it's just how terrible those women feel after seeing all those celebrities that are back to size four. It's just this whole, this whole idea yeah, of, I of mean, the yeah. media and the, you know, what do they do to us? How and nor do they images? have the PR people to advise them on their social networking. So, um, yeah, it, it's, you know, I'm not one to blame fashion magazines for women's, you know, insecurities about their bodies. I think there's a far more complex than that. But I think social networking can be, is an, you know, an ex, ex you know, an exaggeration of that. Um, and I don't think we can blame celebrities. I think every woman from 14 on has some, you know, from various outlets becomes aware of their bodies. Um, this being one of them, and this being an increasing one as well. Regarding the celebrities, they are becoming the heroes, they're the idols. So in a way, we cannot blame them, but yes, we can. Like, I've seen um, a photograph of Kate Blanchett in Vogue, where she was chewing on her golden bracelet. I'm like, what are you doing? You just played such a great role in Woody Allen's, you know, Blue Jasmine. And now you're here on this freaking carpet chewing on your bracelet. Why? You know, you are somebody who I look up to. You are a female. You are very creative. And then there we go. Back to the carpet. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just uh, wondering, with all the images that we see on uh, Instagram, Snapchat, do you think the viewers are becoming more visually literate? Or yeah. Are we just okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I notice this again when I'm teaching, but also people walking <coughs> into an exhibition, yeah. they can decode an image like that. You know, it took me a long time to work through that uh, Janine Antoni. You know, um, and they might not have those art historical references, but they, they'll get it yeah. instantly, yeah. And, they, and what also comes with that is a, a kind of uh, an understanding about advertising much better than, than my generation certainly had. Right. And, I, and it's fa I find it fascinating, and the, the ability to process so many more. You know, I can only look at about two images before I go, oh, hang on, I've got to clean my head. <laughs> But, you know, I can't take, you know, you know maybe 500, 600 a day that we see at least. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, they're all, they're all networked and they're unhinged from context, which I think is problematical in itself. But um, I can't take that in. But, but people can. And they, they can make those links much faster.
first of all, very interesting lecture bringing in these uh, very un very prevalent aspects in our lives. I just wanted to add on to what Katrine was saying about the development of use in, in not selfies, but Snapchat more often than not, is because I use it a lot. And every time I open that application, it's never not blank. There's always something there. It's interesting how, how compared to Instagram, Snapchat's more closed because it's only people you would know or people in your contacts list and whatever. So you have a, it gives you an even more in-depth look into people's lives and pe people tend to bring out things you wouldn't normally see. Like one of my friends literally makes stories of his life on it. Yeah, I think Snapchat is, is wider than Instagram. I think Instagram is the, is the I use this phrase norm core, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the same way that Facebook <coughs> is not this or Elo, this, these two, two, these two new ones. It's, it's mainstream mass yeah. imaging. Although you still get, as you as to hear was mentioning about addictions to selfies and things, I have to agree heavily. I've seen, I've literally seen, and this is true fact, a person take a selfie, which was the same format, the same composition, seven times a day. And I'd reflare it, and it was like just one image after another, and I was flabbergasted at you know how that is. And I'm young, I could say that. Yeah, I'm young, I can say. And so it's even for me, it was just like really, yeah, that many is that necessary? But it's interesting you brought it up. But you know, you, you're sitting here, you know, you're you're here to to deconstruct photography. Are you a student here? Yeah. Yeah. So it's you. You already have a kind of interest in dismantling it, whereas most people don't. So I think we've, um, I think there's this, I guess, general idea that selfies are a bit more on the mindless side, but I think that in some ways it's, it's, it could be documentary. It's a, sometimes it's a self-portrait. I take a lot of selfies that I don't post anywhere. It's just, I think that we were becoming more self-aware as people and we just have a more innate desire to document our lives. I'm not sure we have more innate. I think we have easier access to it. I think it's a human compulsion to do that. Um, and uh, the thing about, to make it a selfie, I think it has to go online and it has to be communicative. And if you're taking them and not posting them, then they're not selfies, they're self-portraits. Um, I'm guilty of Snapchatting this lecture <laughs> before it started. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think it definitely is an, is an obsession of like documenting everything in your life. Like even things that aren't necessary, I'll just document it instead of seeing it and absorbing it. Yeah, we all do it. And it's just awful. I don't know, now I feel really awful no, for I Snapchatting it. it. No, I don't think it is. <laughs> I think it's just a shift. Yeah. And we're not quite sure, when we're in the middle of an ideology, we're not quite sure what it is. It's much easier to look back and go, oh, that was all about that in the 60s. You know, we're right in the middle of it, so it's very hard to grasp it and really figure out why it is and what we're doing. Um, so don't beat yourself up about it, really. <laughs> and if anyone's tweeted, make sure you, you know, you've, you've, you know, you hashtag me. <laughs> it's a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> On that note, I think you are, you've, it's uh, hashtag SVA digital photo, <laughs> people. Yeah. On that note, I think you gave us a lot to think about, and we all want selfie sticks for Christmas. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for skating. Yep.